but I wanted to go through all this, uh, what we have done, because everything we did will reappear later, of course. All these integration techniques, the tricks, the variable substitutions, the beta functions, the gamma functions, the expansions, everything will appear later, and so it is good to have it collected once and for all. But clearly, this was not the essence of the course. So let us now, for the first time, do a quantum field theory calculation. And this is an example. And uh, this is the first lecture. And we will directly jump in to a concrete calculation without much, much explanations. And uh, afterwards, during the semester, we will do lots of discussions. But first, let us calculate this Feynman diagram. And we will do it in Feynman parameters. So this also appeared yesterday already in the exercise. So now uh, we will do actually the full calculation. So this is a one loop diagram, a two point function or a self energy diagram at one loop. Let us use as an incoming momentum Q. Then we have two propagators and uh, from momentum conservation here we have a momentum Q plus K and here flows backwards a loop momentum K. K is arbitrary, undefined by momentum conservation. Therefore, it is a loop momentum and we need to integrate over it in quantum field theory. And in dimensional regularization, which we use here, the uh, diagram is defined in this way. We have this prefactor mu to the power d0 minus d. d0 is our integer physical dimension, for example, 4 or 6 sometimes, and d is an arbitrary number, and at the end of the day we take the limit d going to 4 or d going to 6. But uh, it is kept as a regularization parameter first. Then we have a d-dimensional integration over the d-dimensional loop momentum, and again, I don't know how this can work, how can this work theoretically? to write down a loop integral in this half of the blackboard. Am I writing too big or do you have a solution for this? Uh, I think it was your recommendation to... Right, how could I do it with three? I think that wouldn't help either. But uh, like this, one big part and a small part, which is then completely cramped and unorganized. This is my normal solution. I don't know what to do. So, the denominator or the integrand is the product of the two propagators and uh, it's just the loop calculation so we don't put any coupling constants or any i's for the propagators, we just put the denominators which is for the upper line q plus k square minus m square plus i epsilon and for the lower propagator it is just k square minus m square plus i epsilon. So two propagators with different momenta, and we assume that the masses of the propagators are the same and non-zero. This is a simple case, and uh, let us compute this Feynman diagram as a start. So just to uh, introduce some simple notation, this is a product of two factors in the denominator. Let's call the product 
P1 times D2, so for two denominator factors. And then it is clear, we now have the situation that the denominator is a product of two objects. We don't like the product, we want a sum because our master formula looks like something raised to some power, not a product of two different things. Therefore, we want to bring this back to the form of the master formula by doing Feynman parametrization. So we introduce Feynman parameters and another notation for this integration measure. I simply use this symbol with a subscript K. This uh, contains all of these factors. Then we introduce now our Feynman parametrization, integral zero to one dx, and the product is converted to d1 times x plus d2 times one minus x, and the whole thing squared. This is Feynman parametrization, and now uh, in the denominator we have a linear combination of the two factors, and we need to work with them. So now we look at this linear combination separately and bring it to some nice form using standard tricks, which you can always do also in more complicated diagrams. So let's look at it. d1 times x plus d2 times 1 minus x. Um, let's write it down. d1 is q plus k square times x plus the other thing is, contains k square times 1 minus x. Then we have minus m square and the m square comes times x plus 1 minus x. So we get just minus m square and also just plus i epsilon without any x dependence. Now, what we do is we uh, do a, a completion of the square. So we write uh, this thing first in the, as a polynomial in k, k square plus k plus a constant. What is the coefficient of k square? We have here k square times x, k square times one minus x, so the overall coefficient of k square is just one. So we get k square times one, that is nice. Then what is the linear term in k? q plus k square gives two q times k times x. So plus two x q times k. And the rest is a constant. So we get plus q square times x minus m square plus i epsilon. And now we complete the square. So we write this as something square plus a k independent constant. And what is this? We need to do k plus x times q square. Then we get k square plus 2x q dot k plus x square q square, so we subtract q square x square plus q square x minus m square plus i epsilon. Then we have completed the square. And then we can call this, let's say, k prime. Then we see that uh, we can replace in our integral over k, we can replace the integration variable by this shifted integration variable k prime. The measure is the same because it's just a, a linear shift. So d dk is the same as d d k prime. So no problem in uh, substituting the integration variables. So if we do it, our integral of the whole Feynman diagram becomes now the following. We still have the Feynman parameter integral from zero to one. And then we have an integral over the shifted integration variable k prime, but the integration measure is the same as before. And our integrand is now the following. It is this uh, um, bracket square and the content of the bracket is what we wrote here. K prime square plus something else which is k independent minus q square x square plus q square x minus m square plus i epsilon. 
all right? And now we have the master formula expression because this integral is a standard Minkowski space d-dimensional loop integral and the integrand contains just the momentum square plus a constant from the point of view of the loop integration. Therefore, we can plug in the result from the master formula directly and uh, the result is this. What remains is the outer Feynman parameter integral, but then we have here this mu to the power d0 minus d times the master formula copied i times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2 times the gamma function 2 minus d over 2 times this object here. Let's call it minus q. Then we have here the expression k square minus q square. So this q appears to the power d over 2 minus 2. And this q is now a constant from the point of view of the loop integration, but it's of course not a constant in view of x. This q still depends on x, therefore the x integral is a very complicated integral. We have to integrate over this polynomial in x raised to some arbitrary power. It's not an easy integral, but that is the result of this self-energy calculation. So we have now done our first loop calculation in this semester. And we have expressed the result not as a number, but as a one-dimensional integral over a Feynman parameter which runs from 0 to 1. And the integrand is a polynomial raised to some arbitrary power. Let us discuss some points which we can read off from this result. So as I just said, it is still a complicated integral. And uh, this polynomial in X uh, depends on the physics. The physics is represented in um, the momentum Q, which flows into the diagram. And the physics is represented by the mass of the internal lines. So the physics depends on two physical quantities, the momentum and the mass. And this object here depends on both quantities. It depends on Q square and the mass in some shape and form, and therefore, overall, the physics behavior of this result resides in whatever is the result of this x integration, which will be a complicated function of q square and m square. So these are the physics variables in uh, this calculation. Now we can finally come to ultraviolet divergences. And here we can see ultraviolet divergences. They reside in the gamma function. Gamma of 2 minus d over 2. What? is the mathematical structure of the divergences. The divergences manifest themselves in the poles of the gamma function. And the gamma function has simple poles. And uh, simple poles, whenever its argument is 0, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. So that means we have simple poles in the variable d. And what are those simple poles? We have simple poles for the following values for d, namely if d over 2 is 2 or 3 or 4 and so on. Then we have gamma of 0, gamma of minus 1, gamma of minus 2 and so on. So these are poles. In other words, if the dimension is 4 or 6 or 8, then we have a divergence. And this corresponds to the original ultraviolet divergence of the Feynman diagram. Let us just uh, see how we can understand it. We will do this later in more detail, but uh, we can here see here uh, from the original definition of the Feynman diagram why this makes sense 
because we have here overall an integration over a variable k in d dimensions. So, and the integrand depends on k for large k in the ultraviolet where the momentum is large. We can forget about everything except for the case. So then the denominator is simply k to the fourth power. So for ultraviolet values of the momentum, the integral is simply k to the power d divided by k to the power four. And such an integral diverges if the degree of the numerator is bigger or equal than the degree of the denominator. So we expect a divergence if d is four or five or six and so on. But for d smaller than four, the integral converges. For d four or bigger, the integral diverges. And that corresponds exactly to this. So the first divergence is obtained for d equal four, and then there are more divergences if d is even bigger than four. But for d less than four, there is no divergence, and that can be seen by power counting, by simply looking at the behavior of the integrand for a large k. And that also shows that this is really uh, the factor which expresses the ultraviolet divergence. Because if you just see the gamma function, uh, it diverges for some values of its arguments. It might not be easy to know whether this corresponds to an ultraviolet divergence or some other random divergence. But by tracing it back in this way, we have convinced ourselves that this factor is exactly the expression or the manifestation of the original ultraviolet divergence. Good. Now, let us look at the concrete case of the physics dimension equal to four, which is the normal situation, d equal to four. Then we parameterize our regularization dimension as four minus two epsilon. And then this gamma function looks like this, gamma of two minus d over two becomes simply gamma of epsilon. And we know that this simply is one over epsilon plus some non-divergent quantities. Therefore, in four dimensions, the result of the Feynman diagram can be written like this. So we copy the result from here, but plug in four dimensions and uh, do the expansion in epsilon. Then we have the i. Mu is raised to the power four minus d, and this is simply a mu squared to the power epsilon, or mu to the power two epsilon. Then four pi, four pi to this power gives four pi to the power minus two plus epsilon. Then from the gamma function, we get one over epsilon in first approximation, and uh, then we have the integral from zero to one dx of our um, polynomial q, um, and this is now raised to the power minus epsilon. So let us write down a little bit more in detail what it is. So first we can factor out i over 16 pi square. If we evaluate here four pi to the power minus two, and then we get uh, one over 16 pi square. Then for the rest, we do an expansion in epsilon. What happens if we do an expansion in epsilon? This is expandable in epsilon, it's an exponential function. This is like exponential of epsilon times ln mu square, right? This is the same. And then we can expand this in epsilon in Taylor series. And uh, the same we can do for the four pi to the power epsilon and q to the power minus epsilon. And then we get in first approximation, this is one plus epsilon times the logarithm of its argument. And therefore, if we expand, we get one over epsilon times the first order in all the other quantities in epsilon is just one. So one over epsilon times one then times one over epsilon times the first order in all these epsilon dependent quantities, which is integral zero to one 
dx of logarithm of 4 pi mu square divided by q. plus additional terms which come from higher orders in these expansions. But these are the lowest orders in the expansion. So we see from this something very important, namely what is actually the divergent part if d goes to 4 or epsilon goes to 0. The divergent part is this 1 over epsilon which originated from the gamma function. And the coefficient of 1 over epsilon is just 1. So it's just a constant, a number, 1, dimensionless, and doesn't depend on any physics quantity. And uh, as a function of epsilon, it's again just a simple pole. So the divergent part is a simple pole. in epsilon, and as a function of the physics variables, it is a constant. It is a constant in q square and m square. Right. This is an important observation you should keep in mind. This is the structure of the divergence of this Feynman diagram. And now if we are interested in physics, which we should be, but not today, um, if we are interested in physics, then we should focus on this remainder here. The remainder contains all the interesting physics results, uh, which is discussed in the quantum field theory one lecture. So it contains logarithms of physical quantities, which uh, give us important physics effects, which can be understood, for example, from the renormalization group equation, and which lead to interesting high and low energy behavior of such quantum field theories. So uh, this is interesting, but uh, the divergent part is extremely simple. It is simple in terms of epsilon, and uh, super simple in terms of the physics quantities. Then, in association to this 1 over epsilon pole, we also get the logarithm of this unphysical object 4 pi mu square, or a logarithm of 4 pi mu square. And you can see from the derivation that the coefficient of the log of mu square and 4 pi is always correlated to the coefficient in epsilon, because all of this arises from the expansion of the product of these quantities in epsilon. So the coefficient of 1 over epsilon is always the same as the coefficient of log 4 pi square, uh, 4 pi mu square. This is a general feature at uh, one loop calculations. Now let us do as the next step the same thing in six dimensions and see how the result looks like in six dimensions. And by the way, this could also be a homework. Um, repeat everything we do in four dimensions in six dimensions. But uh, since it's the first time we do it here. So since nobody is coming, it seems we have an infinite amount of time. That is good. Uh, sorry for you. So if you have to leave, uh, leave. But I will go on because uh, it would be a waste of preparation time if I wouldn't go on. But we are still at one loop. And uh, let us do the same discussion in six dimensions, where we set the regularization dimension to 6 minus 2 epsilon and do the same kind of expansion. If we do this, then um, our full result contains still the gamma function 2 minus d over 2. And plugging in 6 minus 2 epsilon, we get gamma of epsilon minus 1, which we can also expand. And uh, the expand gives minus 1 over epsilon plus some non-divergent constants. And uh, this can also be plugged into the 
general result of the Feynman diagram and then we get I times mu to the power two epsilon. We always get this mu to the power two epsilon. And then, then we get four pi. Four pi now to the power minus three plus epsilon. Before we had minus two plus epsilon. Now we have minus three plus epsilon because of six dimensions. Then from the gamma function we get minus one over epsilon instead of plus one over epsilon. And we have the Feynman parameter integral dx of q. And uh, instead of q to the power minus epsilon, we now get q to the power one minus epsilon. And uh, this is only the first um, approximation of the gamma function, so we neglected some non-divergent terms here. And again, we can combine the epsilon independent quantities uh, and epsilon dependent approximation. So epsilon independent is four pi to the power three now, gives i over 64 pi cubed as a prefactor. So this is the typical prefactor in six dimensions. And then we do the expansion in epsilon of the rest. And what we get here is now the expansion in epsilon gives here an integral over dx of q to the power one. This is still uh, present as a prefactor of the full result, epsilon independently. Therefore, in the expansion in epsilon, the first thing that we get is one over epsilon times q to the power one. So the coefficient of one over epsilon is not one like in the previous case, but the coefficient of one over epsilon is minus the integral zero to one dx of q. Then we go on in the expansion. Then we need to take this exponential. So this is one plus epsilon times log mu squared, one plus epsilon times log four pi, one minus epsilon times log q. Combining it with this one over epsilon gives minus integral zero to one dx of q to the power one times log four pi mu square divided by q. And then some other terms we have neglected in our expansion. So this is now significantly more complicated. This is more complicated because we have not only a log, but a product of the log times an integral over Q. And the coefficient of epsilon itself is an integral. Let's evaluate it. What is this integral? This integral is an integral over Q, but what is Q? It's not written here anymore, but Q was this uh, polynomial that we obtained from Feynman parameters. And the polynomial is this, minus Q squared times X times one minus X plus M square. Therefore, if we do the integral, it's actually doable. It's not a very difficult integral. What is the result? The result of the integral over x here, the x dependence is x minus x square. So the integral over x from zero to one, what is it? One half. And the integral over x square is one third. So we get one half minus one third is one over six from this, so we get minus Q square over six, and uh, the M square times a constant integrated from zero to one, just M square. So, this goes here, that means our coefficient of one over epsilon is minus Q square over six plus M square. So it's not a constant, but it's a polynomial in the physics variables q square and m square. And that integral is of course more difficult. So let us summarize what is our divergent part. 
It is in terms of epsilon, again, a simple pole. And it is not a constant, but it is a polynomial of second order in the physics variables in Q square and M square. So, and in fact, in quantum field theory one, uh, we did similar calculations and uh, we could quite easily convince ourselves that this is general. So it is quite clear that in any one loop calculation, the ultraviolet divergence will always appear as a simple pole in epsilon, one over epsilon, and the coefficient of the simple pole will always be a polynomial in the physics variables, in particular in the momentum. And we have observed it here explicitly. And uh, so, of course, this constant here is also a polynomial of degree zero. And here we get a polynomial of degree one. So this is the general situation. Now, having this in mind, we can progress to do a two-loop calculation. Is this thing still running? Okay. Let us do a two-loop calculation, and then um, we can stop for today. So uh, there would be a nice way of taking into account the euler mascaroni constant by writing uh, this gamma of 1 plus epsilon in this way, let's say e to the minus uh, Euler gamma times epsilon times 1 over epsilon. This gives us the first few terms of the expansion, and then it's nice to keep track of the Euler Mascaroni constant because then it appears always on a similar footing as the 4 pi to the power epsilon factors. But I neglected it. It can always be included uh, also in the calculation. So let me just check whether this works. So, now we want to do our first two-loop calculation and see what is similar and what is different to one-loop calculations in view of the divergences. And what we will do is this two-loop self-energy Feynman diagram and we will do it by direct calculation for the massless case m square equals zero. And we can directly calculate it by plugging together all the master formulas and Feynman parametrization formulas that we have. The calculation will be extremely simple, not representative of generic two-loop calculations at all, way, way simpler than a normal calculation will be. But we will focus on the result and look how the structure of the result is, how the ultraviolet divergences appear, and so on. And later, maybe we will do the calculation once again in a different way, which is more similar to how you can do general calculations then it will be actually more difficult, but it will be closer to the general case. But let us first do a direct calculation. Let us use this momentum assignment. The momentum P flows into the diagram. Then we have here P plus Q momentum. Then here by momentum conservation, we have Q, Q loop momentum. And uh, in the upper inner loop, we have Q plus a second loop momentum K. And here also a loop momentum K. So we have two loop momenta which we integrate over. In the inner loop, we have K running. And in the outer loop, we have Q running. 
in this direction. And in the inner loop, you see what appears is the diagram we have calculated before in the same notation with external momentum Q flowing into this inner loop diagram. And uh, so we can plug in the previous result and then go on to calculate the outer loop integration. So first, the actual expression is an integral over K and an integral over Q and the integrand with massless case is uh, the product of all these propagators, which is now simply P plus Q square for this propagator, then Q square for that propagator, and another Q square, and then Q plus K square and K square. So there is an inner loop integration over K and then an outer loop integration over Q. And the K integration is already done. So we can plug in the result. This is why this integral is so simple. The K integration is mu to the power d0 minus d times i 4 pi to the power minus d over 2 times the gamma function minus d over 2 times the Feynman parameter integral from 0 to 1 dx of this polynomial minus q square x times 1 minus x plus m square minus i epsilon raised to the power d over 2 minus 2. That is the result of the inner loop. So it's uh, not completely evaluated, but it uh, remains as a one-dimensional integral over x from 0 to 1. But otherwise, this is the result. And now we set the mass to 0 as a simplification. Otherwise, the integral is too difficult for us. But with, in the massless case, we can actually do it. Now. We have not yet done this integral because it uh, was so far not important and it also looked too complicated. But now we have to do it. Now let's do this x integral, but only for the massless case. If you look at this integrand, what do you see? You see, of course, a beta function, right? x and 1 minus x raised to some powers and we integrate over x from 0 to 1. This is the definition of a beta function. Therefore, for the massless case, we have a beta function as the result and then we have a full analytic expression of the whole inner loop integration. And the beta function is then expressed as gamma functions, of course. So, um, All this integration gives us minus q square raised to this power, d over 2 minus 2. And then the remainder is an integral over only the x, x to this power times 1 minus x to the same power. And this is the beta function with uh, this power as the argument, d over 2 minus 1, comma d over 2 minus 1 d over 2 minus 1, because in the definition there was always this power shifted by 1. Right? So this is the result. And if you like, you can express it in terms of gamma functions, or you just leave it as it is. Anyway, that is the result. This is a constant, or I mean it's depending on d, but it doesn't depend on physics. And then we have this physics quantity here, minus q square raised to some power, which um, is not integrated over anymore. So what you can see from this, by taking a step back, the inner loop, so this diagram here, the one loop diagram, is in the end expressed as a product of many, many d-dependent factors with gamma functions, and one factor like this, q square raised to some power. So it depends on the momentum q square which flows into the diagram just power-like. So if we plug it back into this 
full Feynman diagram, then this integration over K gets replaced by all of this, in particular by Q square raised to this power. So we can plug in just Q square raised to this power into the denominator. And then it looks like just another factor of Q square in the denominator. Nothing more complicated than this. So that means our full two-loop diagram now has this form, writing down all the factors mu to the d0 minus d times i times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2 times gamma of 2 minus d over 2 times the beta function, beta of d over 2 minus 1, comma d over 2 minus 1, times the remaining loop integration over q, and the integrand is now 1 over p plus q square, q square times q square times minus q square raised to this power uh, 2 minus d over 2. That is the integrand. And of course, we have q square, q square, q square, so we can combine all the q square factors. And uh, the minus is a bit important because we are ignoring here a little bit this i epsilon prescription, but in principle, the i epsilon prescription always tells us uh, what it means to have minus 1 raised to some power, to some complex power. Uh, that depends on the i epsilon prescription. Therefore, if I, I do not just um, ignore the minus 1, because it really is minus 1 plus i epsilon. And uh, therefore, I'm a little bit careful here. Um, but not too careful, actually, if you want to do it more seriously and keep track of the factors of i epsilon, you would have to pay closer attention that we want to do right now. That is not the main point of our discussion. But I'm doing it correctly, but uh, I'm not um, explaining in too, details, too much detail uh, the i epsilon behavior. Now, what I'm wanting to explain in detail is how we can treat this, because now we can combine uh, these two factors again with Feynman parameters. So we have now this uh, situation of a denominator with factors raised to different powers. We have this factor raised to power 1 and uh, q square raised to some random power. But we can combine it using this generalized form of Feynman parameters. Let's do it and let's insert minus 1 here to make everything uniformly um, negative then we can write the following 1 over minus p square p plus q square and then minus q square to the power 4 minus d over 2. Okay? So this q square square is the same as minus q square square and then we can combine the powers of minus q square to 4 minus d over 2 and uh, I just add in here a minus 1 which we shouldn't forget in the end. And then we can combine everything using Feynman parameters in the general form. 0 to 1, dx1, dx2, because we have two different factors, two different powers. And then uh, we have this delta function, 1 minus x1 minus x2. And then you remember this general form of Feynman parameters, which involve lots of gamma functions. And the gamma functions which are involved are the following. We have one gamma function in the numerator, which contains the sum of the exponents. The sum of the exponents is 5 minus d over 2. And gamma functions in the denominator corresponding to each exponent, gamma of 1 times gamma of 4 minus d over 2. So these are the individual exponents. Then we have a product x1 raised to uh, the appropriate power, which is 1 minus 1 is x1 to the power 0, and x2 raised to the appropriate power 3 minus d over 2. So these x's are always raised to the appropriate powers minus 1. 
So we get this. And in the denominator, we get the linear combination minus p plus q squared times x1 minus q squared times x2 raised to the appropriate sum of all powers, 5 minus d over 2. Okay. This is the result of the Feynman parametrization. And of course, this looks now very complicated because of the gamma functions, but I mean, in the end, gamma functions are known, and therefore, this is not as complicated as it looks. But we have managed to uh, obtain a denominator, which is this usual linear combination. And we can, again, apply the same technique as before, uh, complete the square. And then we are able to relate it to the master formula and do the loop integral. So in the denominator, we have this minus um, if we expand it, okay, or let us, let us first do one more step. Let us do one of the x integrations because the delta function means, of course, that uh, really uh, x1 is uh, 1 minus x2 or vice versa. So we can do one integration. Uh, which one should we do? Let us do the one which um, is the leads to the simpler denominator. And the simpler denominator means we should integrate over x1. And afterwards, x2 becomes 1 minus x1. So let's call it then simply x. And then we have here the gamma function, gamma of 5 minus d over 2, divided by gamma of 4 minus d over 2. Gamma of 1 is 1, of course. So then we have in the numerator 1 minus x to the power 3 minus d over 2. And in the denominator, we have now um, here, this is x and this is 1 minus x. So we have minus q square times x uh, plus 1 minus x gives, gives us minus q square times 1 minus 2q dot p times x1. So minus q dot p times x and uh, minus p squared times x and then minus i epsilon and the whole thing to the power 5 minus d over 2. So and again, okay, we can directly here complete the square and write this as minus q minus a shift plus x times p square. Then um, we have to subtract or add p square times x square minus p square times x minus i epsilon. And we could call this a new integration variable q, q prime. Uh, and the integration measure is not changed by this substitution. Okay, so this is our Feynman parametrization. If you uh, look where it came from, this was the full expression for our two-loop integral. Over there, we have the first line, which is just a product of numbers, times the integral in the second line. And the integrand has now become this object. Therefore, we can summarize again everything and write down the following for the full two-loop diagram. So copy from above mu to the power d0 minus d times i for pi to the power minus d over 2 times gamma of 2 minus d over 2 times the beta function with these two arguments times the integral in the second line. In the integral in the second line contains now this ratio of gamma functions. And I reinstated the minus 
remember the minus which I uh, plugged in here by hand in order to make the Feynman parametrization uniform. So this is the minus here, uh, which we didn't want to forget. And then we have the loop integration and the x integration. Integral 0 to 1 x and the integration over the shifted loop momentum q prime. And the integrand is 1 minus x to the power 3 minus d over 2 divided by minus q square plus, let's call it q2 minus i epsilon. Um, and again, the blackboard is not big enough to the power 5 minus d over 2. So here I abbreviated Q2. Okay, so this came from here. We completed the square, uh, deleted uh, what was the result of completing the square, but the result was this, uh, P square times X times X minus one. Okay, so now we have a one-dimensional loop integral or a d-dimensional one-loop integration. And the integrand is exactly the one of the master formula, so we can directly plug in the result. And the result will be Q2 raised to some appropriate power times uh, products of gamma functions and other factors. So. Should I do this or yeah, why not? I mean, okay, uh, the problem is it's a bit unorganized now because I don't have enough space. So just this uh, Q prime integration will give, of course, the following mu to the power d0 minus d times i 4 pi to the power minus d over 2 from the master formula times uh, combinations of gamma functions. And now the combination of gamma functions depends on this exponent here, which is a non-integer exponent. But nevertheless, the master formula applies. And the result is gamma of this exponent, 5 minus d over 2 minus d over 2 because the master formula contains this exponent minus d over 2. So now this is the therefore the resulting gamma function and divided by gamma of the exponent gamma of 5 minus d over 2. This is now the combination of gamma functions in the master formula and then what remains is the integral 0 to 1 uh, dx of this uh, resulting Q2 and the resulting Q2 is, I write it down here, P square times X or minus P square times X times one minus X minus I epsilon to the appropriate power and the appropriate power, if you look at the master formula, turns out to be D minus five. Or let's let's say let us let us look at this entire object, which I now mark in orange. This entire orange object is the integral over x and the loop integral. Now I've written down the result of the loop integral. Let me add also the x integral. Then we get here in addition the x dependence which is 1 minus x to the power 3 minus d over 2. 
Now, what do you see? You see a physics quantity p square raised to some power. Overall, p square is raised to the power d minus 5. This is where the physics quantity comes in. And then we get the x integral, and the x integral has the integrand x times 1 minus x raised to some power times 1 minus x raised to another power. This is again a beta function because we can combine the 1 minus x, and then we have just the beta function again. I told you that this integral is super simple. It's not uh, normal that you can evaluate all integrals and you just obtain beta functions and gamma functions. Normally, the integrals are not easily solvable in terms of such elementary functions. But it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, what we will see is that the divergence structure and these 1 over epsilon poles, they will always behave similarly to what we do here. But uh, the remainder, the finite, interesting physics result is much more difficult. But here, we can evaluate everything explicitly. But the result for the divergence is representative. It's just the simplicity of the calculation is not representative. But still, uh, I mean, it's not so simple, actually. Still, we need to go through a lot of formulas. And um, probably, it takes a while to absorb all of those calculational steps. But uh, in the end, each step uh, works always in the same way. But that means we have soon reached our final goal of today's lecture. Namely, we can now write down the combination of all these factors and write down the full result of our Feynman diagram. The full result of the Feynman diagram is now the combination of the following factors. First, the combination of those factors in the first line which came from the inner loop, one loop calculation. Then, the factors here, which came from the Feynman parametrization of the outer loop, and then those factors here, which come from the outer loop integration, and then the result of the beta function from here, which comes from the Feynman parameter integral. And I will now write down everything. So we have mu to the power d0 minus d times i times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2. And the whole thing is squared because we get each of these factors twice from the two different loop integrations. Then we have the gamma functions. Gamma of 2 minus d over 2 times the beta function of d over 2 minus 1, comma d over 2 minus 1. This came from the inner loop integration times minus gamma of uh, 5 minus d divided by gamma of 4 minus d over 2. And here something has happened. Uh, let me first write this down. Beta d minus 4 d over 2 minus 1. Here something has happened. Namely, from the Feynman parametrization, we obtained this gamma function with the argument 5 minus d over 2. And uh, somehow, in the outer loop integration, we obtained 1 over the same gamma function, so the two cancel. Therefore, this cancels. But what does not cancel is this gamma of 5 minus d and the denominator gamma of 4 minus d over 2. And then this is the beta function I mentioned which comes from this Feynman parameter integral. So this is the combination of gamma factors from the outer loop integration. And then we have the physics factor minus p square minus i epsilon. So here I reinstate the minus i epsilon prescription in the right place to the power d minus 5. So this is the final result, the exact result 
completely exact in everything, in all variables, in epsilon, in d, and in p square. And um, let us maybe comment what these factors mean once again, so maybe we write it down. So the first factor arises in each loop integration, so the 4 pi is basically angular variables, angular, mom, uh, angular integrations, spherical coordinates gives us those 4 pi factors. The i comes from the Wick rotation and the mu factor is inserted by hand for dimensional regularization and uh, each loop integration gives us such a factor. Let's call it a standard loop factor for every loop integration, we will get such a factor. The second line or, uh, originated from the one loop calculation of the inner loop. And it contains the famous gamma function, gamma of 2 minus d over 2, which reflects the ultraviolet divergences of the inner loop, and which still reflects it. It still contains the 1 over epsilon points. This comes from the outer loop integration. So we replace the inner loop by its result, which can be written in the form of a propagator raised to some uh, non-integer power. We could combine it and do the loop integration, and that resulted in this. So this is the outer overall uh, loop integration. And it contains also various gamma functions. In particular, it contains this gamma of 5 minus d, which reflects the outer ultraviolet divergence, as I will explain. And then this is the dependence on physics. By the way, the dependence on physics we knew from before, from dimensional analysis, because the thing can only depend on p square because there is nothing else. And uh, we can look at what is the unit of the result, and then we know this must appear in the final result, and it does. But the prefactor is, of course, non-trivial. And the prefactor does not only contain divergences, but the prefactor is, of course, also important for physics. I mean, it matters whether we get one half or one quarter or something else. OK. Now uh, I want to spend just a few moments on discussing the result, and then we are done. And you can go through it once again at home. So let me write down some discussion points. I already mentioned the inner loop leads to this gamma function of 2 minus d over 2, which reflects its ultraviolet divergences. And we already saw this has a pole if d is 4 or bigger than 4. So it has a pole concretely for d equal 4 or 6 or 8 and so on. Now we found the overall two loop integration gave us this additional gamma function, gamma of 5 minus d. This corresponds to the ultraviolet divergence of the overall two-loop uh, integral. 
And you see it also has a pole if D is five, six, seven, and so on, because then we get gamma of zero, gamma of minus one, gamma of minus two. So this is divergent not for D equal four, but if D is five or bigger. Can we understand this? Yes, we can. Namely, let's look at a one loop diagram on its own and just look at the ultraviolet behavior. That means the integration momentum goes to infinity. Then we just have a d-dimensional momentum integral and the denominator behaves like k to the fourth power. So this is like dk times k to the power d minus one divided by k to the fourth. So this, if d is four, then we have an integral dk over k. This is logarithmically divergent. Or if d is six, then we have dk uh, times k, which is quadratically divergent. So just from power counting, looking at the behavior of the integrand at large momenta, we see that exactly this behavior is correct. Namely, if d is four or bigger, the integral diverges at k going to infinity. So we understand this. Can we also understand the other gamma function? Yes, we can. Let us look at the full loop integral. The full loop integral, if q goes to infinity and k goes to infinity at the same time, then we have overall d-dimensional k and d-dimensional q integration. And how does the integrand behave? If you remember, we had uh, q square, q square, q square, k square, k square. Then we have k to the fourth and q to the sixth. So if we just uh, combine all the loop momenta, then this is like uh, let's say 2D dimensional integral over some general variable L divided by L to the power 10. And then we have the same power counting, namely such an integration diverges if 2L is 10 or bigger. In other words, if D is five or bigger, then this overall integration diverges. So we understand that the first divergence appears at d equal five and then at higher dimensions. Therefore, we know for sure that exactly these gamma functions are the ones which manifest our ultraviolet divergences. And there are two kinds of these divergences, namely the subdivergence of a one loop subdiagram and an overall divergence of the full diagram where we just generally combine all loop momenta into one generic momentum and don't distinguish. Now, I think I want to, uh, as a next point of discussion, again do the expansion around d equal four and d equal six and let's make it a homework expand for d0 equal four and d equal four minus two epsilon. If you do that, then of course the overall outer loop is finite. You, not, you do not get a divergence from this second gamma function. And the divergence of the full result is, um, let's say, limited. Do it at home and see what happens. But what we will do now is to do the expansion in six dimensions where the outer loop is also divergent and we therefore get a double divergence. And that's this, the generic case of such a two loop diagram. So let's expand set d0 equal six and d equals six minus two epsilon. 
then what do we get from here? We have mu uh, 4 pi mu square um, overall to the power epsilon, right? So this is mu to the 2 epsilon, 4 pi to the epsilon, and uh, the whole thing squared, therefore to the power 2 epsilon. Then we have i divided by 64 pi cubed square. Then we have completely dealt with the first line. Then from the second line, we get here gamma function of 2 minus d over 2. If you remember from the before, d equals 6. So we get gamma of epsilon minus 1. This is minus 1 over epsilon. So we get minus 1 over epsilon in first approximation plus constant terms and so on and higher orders in epsilon. The beta function, what is the beta function? We Let's write it down. Beta function d over 2, so 3 minus 1 is beta of 2 comma 2, whatever it is, plus higher orders in epsilon. But let's not worry about the higher orders in epsilon. Then um, this line here from the outer loop, what is it? Minus gamma, so 6, we get gamma of minus 1 plus 2 epsilon in the numerator. And we see this gives a pole, as we expect. In the denominator, we have gamma of 4 minus 3. This is gamma of 1 plus epsilon. So this is finite, by the way. So therefore, I only uh, discussed the two gamma functions, which are actually divergent. So the other gamma functions and the beta functions, they are not divergent. So this goes to 1. Then beta uh, of 2, comma um, 6 over 2 is 3 minus 1 gives 2. Beta of 2, comma 2 again. Plus higher orders. And then times minus p square uh, to the power 1 minus 2 epsilon. So, let's expand again. So here, this is not yet expanded, um, including the minus 1. So this is again um, minus 1 over 2 epsilon this time. Minus 1 over 2 epsilon times minus 1 here, and this is 1. So we get plus 1 over 2 epsilon in first approximation from uh, this expression. Okay, so overall we have minus 1 over epsilon plus 1 over 2 epsilon. We have these factors here and we have the beta function. What is the beta function of 2 comma 2? Small exercise for you. This is gamma of the sum of the arguments, gamma of 4 divided by uh, no, sorry, it's the product of the two individual gammas, gamma of 2 times gamma of 2 divided by gamma of the sum, gamma of 4. Gamma of 2 is 1 factorial, so gamma of 2 is 1. Gamma of 4 is 3 factorial, so it's 6. So this is 1 over 6. Okay. So beta of 2 comma 2 is 1 over 6. So we get it twice, 1 over 6 times 1 over 6. And that means we can combine everything. So maybe in this order, let's first start with this uh, angular factor, i over 64 pi cubed square. So in six dimensions for each loop, we get this factor. Then from the beta functions, we get 1 over 36. And here we have a 2 in the denominator, so we get 1 over 72 times minus 1 over epsilon square from the 2, 1 over epsilons. And then we have minus p square 
to the power one minus two epsilon. So let's first write down minus p square, or let, let me write down the minus p square here, minus p square here over 72. And then the rest comes to the power epsilon. Four pi mu squared to the power two epsilon and minus p squared to the power minus two epsilon. Overall, that means we have four pi mu squared divided by minus p squared, and if you want, minus i epsilon to the power two epsilon. And of course, this is only the first approximation. There are everywhere, there are higher order terms in epsilon. And uh, instead of one over epsilon squared, there is also one over epsilon, epsilon to the zero, and so on. We neglected all of those. But let's write down what we get from here. This is important. I over 64 pi cubed square times minus p squared divided by 72. And now the expansion. So what do we get? We get one over epsilon square and this we need to expand in an exponential series. This is exponential of two epsilon times log of that. So we get one plus two epsilon times log of that plus epsilon square times log square all of this times one over epsilon squared. That means we have minus one over epsilon squared times one from the exponential. Then one over epsilon squared times two epsilon gives minus one over epsilon times two times logarithm of this argument. Four pi mu square divided by minus p square minus i epsilon. Then one over epsilon square times the second order in the exponential series is uh, what is the second order of an exponential? It's argument square divided by two. So minus one over epsilon square times argument square divided by two gives. 4 epsilon squared divided by 2 gives 2 epsilon squared. 2 epsilon squared divided by epsilon squared gives minus 2 times log square of the argument 4 pi mu squared divided by minus p squared minus i epsilon and the log square plus dot 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 higher order terms in epsilon which include uh, additional terms with one over epsilon, additional terms, epsilon to the zero, and so on. But we definitely get those terms here. And this is now the end of today's lecture. This is a disaster for us, if you know quantum field theory one, and if you remember the previous result from the one loop calculation. because there is now a huge difference between the structure of this result and the previous one, in that the one over epsilon pole is not anymore a polynomial in the physics variables, but it's a logarithm. And what is the problem with a logarithm? A logarithm of a momentum can never appear as a Feynman rule. And that means this divergence here cannot be canceled by counterterm Feynman rules. And this is the difference to one loop, because at one loop, the divergence was always a polynomial in the momenta. They can arise as Feynman rules. Therefore, if we add counterterm Feynman rules, the divergences can be canceled. And that is not possible here. Therefore, this log times one over epsilon uh, is disturbing us and is the new thing which happens if we do two loop renormalization. So let me write this down. The divergent part contains now one over epsilon square and one over epsilon poles.
the one over epsilon square is indeed a polynomial. One over epsilon square, don't forget the minus p square, the one over epsilon is a polynomial of second degree in the momentum. So it is a polynomial in p. But the one over epsilon is non-polynomial in p square, and that is the surprising result. On the other hand, we see something that is familiar from quantum field theory one, namely uh, all these terms here are of course correlated. The one over epsilon square is actually the only origin of all these terms. The one over epsilon determines this log from the expansion and it also determines this log square also from the same expansion. So whenever we know this one over epsilon square, we automatically know for sure that those logarithms must also arise and they do. So this is correlated. So in, in a sense, if we could only calculate the one over epsilon square pole, you could reconstruct theoretically all the other terms without actually calculating them. And we did similar things in quantum field theory one. But uh, that is a side remark. The important remark for us is this non-polynomial divergence, which means that we cannot write down counterterm Feynman rules to cancel it, but something more complicated has to happen. And this uh, more complicated thing that will happen is, of course, that we have to do sub-renormalization, which means that there are such Feynman diagrams which contain a one-loop counterterm insertion inserted into a two-loop diagram, and then this cancels part of the divergence here, and the combination of this is still divergent, but the divergence of the combination is polynomial in the momentum. And then we can cancel the remaining divergence by a counterterm coming from a Lagrangian. This is part of the content of the next few lectures. But here we have for the first time see an explicit result of a two-loop calculation. Sorry that it took so long, but uh, here you have an explicit example where you can understand all the details of the calculation. You can reconstruct all the steps and probably you should go through it once again to familiarize yourself with it. Uh, as I said, let's do as a homework uh, the same expansion in four dimensions instead of six dimensions. This forces you to go through uh, the result once again and see what happens in that case, whether you get a non-polynomial divergence as well or not. You will see. And um, then that's it for today. And um, let's discuss any questions that come up to this calculation next Wednesday in the interactive online session. So please think of questions beforehand try to do this, and um, next Thursday we will go on with um, serious topics. Okay, thanks.